Haggai chapter 1 in your Bible. I don't know when the last time you were in Haggai was, uh, third from the last book in the Old Testament. Let's worship the Lord together uh, through the uh, preaching of His Word and the receiving of His Word. Haggai chapter 1 is where we'll be. Let me begin by calling your attention to an observation made by Arturo Azurdia, my friend and colleague at Western Seminary, who, by the way, will be here a year from now for the Adams Lecture. He said this, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit is not synonymous with the effects or influences of the Spirit. To be sure, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit is a fact that Christians can always assume. Being fully divine, He is always present. In contrast, The effects of his presence can never be presupposed. That is to say, they can be graciously given, they can be judiciously withdrawn. And so the simple question on the table this morning is, are you in hot pursuit of the effects and the influences of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your ministry, or are you passive about it simply because you know he indwells you? Hear the word of the Lord, Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. So he's got all the bases covered. God speaks, he speaks to his prophet, and through his prophet he speaks to the government leadership, he speaks to the religious leadership, and through them he speaks to his people. Verse two, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Agai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while, the ho- while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build this house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with, is is running for his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth on man and beast, and on all their labors." Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Agai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. So the year is 520 B.C. Just to make sure we have the back story, it was in... 586 that the Babylonians had flooded into Jerusalem and leveled it, including the temple, and began to deport, carry off many of the citizens of Jerusalem into exile. In 539 B.C., Cyrus, king of Persians, overtook the Babylonians, and and a year later he issued an edict which allowed 
many of the Jews to begin to make their way back into the homeland and rebuild their houses and rebuild their, their, their city and rebuild the temple. And that's ex- exactly what they did. And they came into the homeland and for nine months they took up their tools and they worked on the temple to reestablish the icon of the presence of God in their midst. And they got the foundation laid and then they quit. They threw down their tools and they went home. And in 520 BC, God speaks to the prophet Haggai through him to the government leaders, to the religious leaders and to the people. And he beckons them back to this task of rebuilding that which he had established as not just the icon, but the venue, the medium through which they would engage and experience his presence in their midst. Now we need to make sure before we jump into this text that we understand why it would be important for us to come to a place like this this morning. So here's what I want to do. I want to answer three questions, uh, and I want to begin with the question, what is the relevance? Why would we come here, and what does this have to say to our lives? And then I want us to ask and answer the question, what's the problem here? And then I want us to look at what's the solution, because the stakes are incredibly high. So what's the relevance? Why would people living on this side of the cross come to a text like Agai chapter 1 and ask the question, what does God have to say to us? Well, let's make sure we understand our position on this side of the cross and its relationship with what is going on here. I'll make all your attention to three realities. Number one, the temple is Christ's presence. The temple is Christ's presence. God did not establish that physical building as in game. He established it as a representation of that which is to come, which you and I are the beneficiaries of, and that is the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. We come over into the New Testament, that's very clear. John chapter two, Jesus was walking by uh, the the temple with some of his critics, and they said, what sign will you give us to, to, to prove that you're who you say you are? He said, tear this building down, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. They laughed at him and said, it took our forefathers 46 years to build this building. How can you rebuild it in three days? But then John tells us, but he was talking about the temple of his body. Jesus is that temple. But you know, the New Testament doesn't stop there. When Jesus gets in your life and he gets in my life, we become the temple, right? This is why the apostle Paul said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when he was, he, was, he was rebuking the Corinthians for their sexual immorality, he said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in you? So Jesus is the temple and Jesus gets in your life and my life, he becomes a temple. But guess what? It doesn't stop there. When we come together as the body of Christ, and I'm not talking about in a gathering like this, I'm talking about in, in our existence as the church, guess what we become? We become the temple of God. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said it in Ephesians chapter 2. You're being built as a holy temple unto the Lord, a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. So Jesus is the temple. Jesus gets in you and me. Our bodies become the temple. We come together as the church. The church becomes the temple, the presence of God. But the New Testament isn't done. John, in getting his uh, advanced tour of the New Jerusalem of heaven, made an observation in Revelation chapter 21. He said, I, but I saw, I saw no temple. And then he makes this statement. He said, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So you do the math. Jesus is the temple. Jesus gets in you. You're the temple. You come together as the body of Christ. We're the temple together, but we are looking for, waiting for, moving toward that time when we will experience the presence of God in Christ Jesus for all of eternity. We cannot afford to come to this passage of Scripture without looking from our angle at this story. Why? Because this is not about a building program. It's not about a command for us to build more buildings as a seminary, for our churches to build more buildings. The time uh, certainly come for for, for, for those needs in in our ministry, but that's not what this is about. This is about rebuilding 
For them, yes, that physical structure, which was the icon of God's presence, but for us, it is a story that has everything to do with the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and his activity. Secondly, the laborers are Christ's people. Don't miss it. There are laborers in this passage of Scripture that are told to get physical tools and go get physical wood, or, uh, literal wood, and bring all of those materials together and build a literal physical temple. That's what's going on here. But on this side of the cross, we look back on this, it would be easy for us to rest just in the reality that we are the temple and forget that we too have been called upon to be the laborers. You remember what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians? He said, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You're God's building. According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And just so we don't misunderstand what we're working on and working toward A few verses later, Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So we need to understand when we come to Haggai chapter one, we're not just looking at a Bible story about some people that were told to build a physical structure. We're looking at a story that was a precursor to the reality that every one of us are beckoned to. And that is to be laborers, to be workmen building on a foundation, foundation which has been laid, Jesus Christ, no other foundation, but we are called to the task to be laborers in building this dwelling place for God in the spirit. And so the temple is Christ's presence and the laborers are Christ's people. That's you and that's me. And then finally, just with regard to the relevance of this text, we need to understand what Azertia was trying to tell us and that is the experience isn't presumed. Now this is, this is where I want us to, to, to hang out. This is what I want us to think about today, okay? Because this is the danger. This is the danger and that is that we go through our lives in ministry passive about the presence of Christ in our life through his Holy Spirit and therefore, and it happens all the time, listen brothers and sisters, come in here real close, to go through our entire lives and ministries, yes, with the presence of God in our lives, with him dwelling in us through his Holy Spirit because we are the temple but never experiencing the effects and the influences of his Spirit in our lives because we haven't processed Maybe the fact that Christ's presence is the temple and we certainly haven't processed the fact that there is a human responsibility for us to be laborers in this deal, in this process. Now, if you're you're wondering about that, about that statement, this experience isn't presumed, let me just remind you. The Apostle Paul would, would, would write to the, the, the Galatians who were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 5 of his letter, he would say, hey, you who are indwelt by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. To the Ephesians in chapter 5 of his letter, he wrote to people who are indwelt by the Spirit. And he said, hey, you who are indwelt by the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. In fact, twice in the book of Ephesians, we have recorded prayers, inspired prayers by the Apostle Paul praying for this very thing, praying that they would get it, pray that they would come to a place that they would realize who they are in Christ, what they have in his presence, and they would experience his presence in an effectual, influential way. So we come to Haggai chapter one, looking from this side of the cross with that question on the table. Are we in hot pursuit? Not of the indwelling of the Spirit because we already have that, but are we in hot pursuit of living lives and ministries that experientially flesh out his effects and his influences in a very real way so that otherworldly supernatural stuff is happening in our lives and ministries? Because beloved, listen to me. If you presume upon this, as I believe these people were doing in 520 BC, if you presume upon it, you can, and I can go through our entire lives and ministries indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but never, never experiencing his effects and his influences. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is clear in verse two. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not yet come. 
Nine months they worked, they laid the foundation, and then they quit. And God says that's a problem. And that's what we just read in this entire chapter, is God articulating the reality that that is of grave concern to him, that his people would press pause on the responsibility that he had given them to rebuild this house that represented his presence. And they had come to the point that they had dropped their tools and they had gone home. Why? Why did they do it? Well, I think there are at least three reasons that we find not just in Haggai, but the historical context that help us to think about not only why they did it, but why we do it. Why some Christians presume upon the effects and influences of the Holy Spirit and therefore they stop being proactive and aggressive and intentional about pursuing his effects and his influence simply because they rest in the foundation that has been laid and the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in them. Let me flesh out those problems this way. Number one, we, we, we quit pursuing the effects and influences of the Spirit because we're deterred by our enemies. This was the case here. Ezra chapter two and three in the same historical context tells us when the children of Israel came back into the homeland, there were some non-Jews there that didn't exactly welcome them with open arms. They, they, didn't, they didn't want them coming back into the land, didn't want them rebuilding their homes, they didn't want them rebuilding the city, they didn't want them rebuilding the temple, and they pushed back on that. And no doubt, this was a frustration, and it was a reason for many of them to quit, to say we're not going for it. And I just want to remind you very simply, we don't have to camp out here long, but you have an enemy who cannot do anything about your salvation. He cannot take God's spirit away from you. It'll never be removed. You've got all of God you're ever going to get, and you will always have all of God you are ever going to get, and your enemy can't do anything about it. But doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make sense that he will do everything he can to bring us to the place where we are satisfied with the foundation that has been laid and lead us to spend our entire lives in ministries never ever experiencing the effects and the influences of the power of God and the presence of God in our lives. We're deterred by our enemies. Secondly, we're discouraged by results, or maybe we should say the lack thereof. No doubt another reason many of the people in Haggai's day had quit is because some of them were old enough to remember the first temple before it was destroyed. And you know what happened? Nine months they worked laying the foundation of this new temple and they stood back one day and they started doing the math in their minds and realized the footprint on this new temple wasn't as big as the previous temple. If you look across the page of the next page in chapter two, God raises this issue in verse three when he says, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Take you back to Ezra chapter three, verse 12. It says the old men looked at it and they wept. They wept because it wasn't as big. And one of the reasons, listen to me, one of the reasons some of us throw down our tools and quit when it comes to actively pursuing the effects and influences of the Holy Spirit is because we look at our ministries and we look at the size of our ministries and we say it's not worth it. It's not as big as the next guys. It's not as big as it used to be. I haven't had this, the impact that I would like to have. Why keep going? And if you've never been there, I promise you, you will be there at some point in your ministry. If you are gauging, listen to me, if you are gauging the effects and influences of the Spirit of God by the size of your ministry or by most of the ways we measure success and effectiveness in our ministries today, You should look across the page at Haggai chapter two, when God encourages the people, says, go back to work, I'll fill this house with my glory, he says in verse seven. And then verse nine, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord. What a word of hope, of encouragement, that the effects and the influences of the Spirit of God are not limited to the size of our ministries. But sometimes 
Some of us throw down our tools and we quit because we're discouraged by results. And then, and then finally, the one that's fleshed out here in this text is that they were distracted by excess. And that can happen for us. We can quit pursuing the effects and influences of the Spirit of God. Listen to me, American Christians, Western Christians. This is a word for us. We get distracted by our excess, don't we? Verse 3, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Agai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses with this ho- while this house lies in ruins? Now listen, God's not rebuking the people for providing for their families. He's, he's, he's rebuking the people because the language of the Old Testament here seems to indicate that they had stopped the work on the temple and they had begun to, they had begun to pursue their own comfort. Language of the Old Testament, the word translated paneled in my English text, paneled owls, is a word that Bible scholars would tell us that would be more equated with something like adornment. And so you plug that in and you hear God say, oh, It's not time to rebuild my house. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your adorned houses, your excess, your comfort while my house lies in ruins? Let's look back from this side of the cross, the presence of Christ in our lives as temples of the Holy Spirit and ask ourselves the question, are we ever tempted to stop being in hot pursuit of the effects and the influences of the Spirit of God because we are so busy about pursuing our convenience, our comfort, our excess, our adornment. It's one of the things that keeps us from going to the nations and unreached people groups. It's one of the things that keeps us from, from, from engaging militantly, aggressively, our communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with sharing with our neighbors, yielding our lives because of a sense of entitlement, a sense of career, a sense of professionalism, and adornment and excess begin to drive the train as opposed to a desperation for and a desire for the effects and the influences of the Holy Spirit to be realized in my life and my ministry. That's the problem. They were distracted by excess. In verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the hills and bring wood and build this house that I, watch this, that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Notice how he's using these ideas synonymously, his pleasure, his glory, his presence through the temple. God takes pleasure. He takes pleasure when he is being glorified in the lives of his children, in the lives of his church, because people are experiencing not just the indwelling of his presence, but the effects and the influences of his presence in our lives. So what's the solution? Well, this is one of those places that the people of God got it. They didn't always get it, still don't always get it, but they got it in this passage of Scripture, and they responded to the Word of God. So what is the solution that we find here on the pages of Scripture, and how does it apply to our lives? First of all, obey the Word of God. It's as simple as that, isn't it? It's not rocket science. We're not just saying, hey, believe the Bible and obey the Bible. Put it in context. Keep it in context. Obey the Word of God about this. Obey the Word of God about being the people of God who are the temple of God. Obey the Word of God that, about being laborers and obey the Word of God that, hey, it's just not automatic because you're the temple. This is what they did in verse 12. Zerubbabel and Joshua, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet. And if you look down at the end of verse 14, it says, and they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. Simple exhortation, simple charge this morning. If you've never entertained it before, If you've never thought about it before, that you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, but it is not automatic that his effects and his influence will be fleshed out and realized experientially in your life. Obey the word of the Lord and take up the tools and go back to work as a laborer pursuing that with everything you've got. Number two, 
Fear the discipline of God. Obey the word of God. Fear the discipline of God. Notice at the end of verse 12, and the people feared the Lord. Now, I know there's a lot of things we could do with this idea of fear, both Old Testament and New Testament. We know that it includes both the concept of trembling in our boots before God because we realize who he is, who we are, and we know the difference between the two. But also the idea of reverential awe before, and both of those come together. So we have to look at this passage and say, well, what's going on here? What does this fear seem to be related to? And I would suggest to you it's related to a very real realization that God had just brought to their mind about his discipline in their lives because they were not pursuing his presence. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And by the way, that's used a number of times. It's not just rhetoric. Stop and think about this, God said. Process this for a moment. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Have you ever felt like that? You can't get yourself going and coming. You live in a rat race. There's always more month left when your check runs out and you never can seem to catch up. And our only answer, our only solution is, I've got to work harder, I've got to get a better job, I've got to make more money, I've got to change my circumstance. And listen, I realize that there are always times when all of those or some of those need to be at play, but God says, consider your ways, think about this for a moment. Could it be that for some of us, the reason for the rat race and the reason that we seem to be putting our money in a bag with holes is because of the discipline of the Lord because he's so desirous of us experiencing the effects and influence of his presence, but we are passive with it and we presume upon it simply because we know he indwells us. Verse nine, you looked for much and behold it came to little and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Notice, this is God's doing. Why declares the Lord? Because of my house that lies in ruins, because of my, my presence that's not being experienced while each of you was running for his own house, therefore I've brought this drought. I've withheld the blessing. You're saying, Jim, could that really be? Does God sometimes withhold his blessing? Does he sometimes withhold the effects and influences of his spirit because we're not proactive and aggressive in pursuing it's effects, his effects and his influence. No doubt he does. No doubt there's something we miss, something we don't experience, something we're not able to embrace when we find ourselves satisfied as simply being the temple and the indwelling place without pursuing his effects and his influences. Obey the word of God, fear the discipline of God, and then finally, and don't miss this, rely on the grace of God. Rely on the grace of God. God meets his people at their point of, point of obedience. You notice it in verse 13. Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people the Lord's message. And listen, listen to this. I am with you, declares the Lord. So wait a second. I thought the, the, the temple was the presence of his. Look at what God does when his people say, count me in. Count me in. I'm going back to work with this. I'm a, I, listen, I can't explain to you the mystery of human responsibility and divine sovereignty. Which came first, the chicken or the egg in this situation? What I know is that this temple was the representation of God's presence. But here the temple is lying with just a foundation. But the people are saying, we're going to rebuild it. And God says, I'm with you. I'm in your midst. You don't have to wait for a physical structure. I've got your back on this, and I am with you. Not only is he with us, in verse 14, notice it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, stirred up the spirit of Joshua, stirred up the spirit of the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house. You see God at work here meeting his people at this place. You say, well, didn't his spirit stir them up to obey? Yes, probably. Doesn't it seem in this text that his stirring up was a response to their obedience? Yes, probably. Can't explain that to you. What I know is they're both in the word of God and God is faithful 
He is faithful to meet his people with a stirring of our hearts to this task and to this work. He never leaves us alone. And then finally, this whole thing, I think, this whole book of Haggai is rooted in this character, Zerubbabel, who we find mentioned about four or five times in the book, another three or four times in the next book in Zechariah. In chapter 2, verse 23, the last verse in the book maybe helps us understand his significance because there God says on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shiltiel, declares the Lord, and make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. You know your Bible chronology. You could go over into Matthew chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, Luke chapter 3, verse 27. See the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and guess whose name shows up? Zerubbabel's. God had taken the signet ring off of Israel and allowed them in a disciplinary mode to go into exile, but he comes back to Zerubbabel and he says, putting the ring back on your finger through you, Zerubbabel. And it would be through his line that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, came into this world to be the very presence of God in our midst and to be the object of our hot pursuit. And when we come to the solution in Haggai chapter 1, the solution is our hot pursuit of the presence of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And that reality, that reality is an encouragement. It is a help and it is a hope for each and every one of us never to go through our lives and ministries passive about God's effects and his influences, never experiencing otherworldly power, but to give ourselves and everything we are to say, Lord, I'm not just going to be your temple, but I want to experience everything you have for me as you are present in my life and my work. Let's pray together. God, we bless you and we give you praise. And we say to you, thank you for trusting us with this stewardship of your presence. And thank you, Lord, for continuing to stir up our hearts, to take up our tools, and to never be satisfied simply with your indwelling, but to be desirous of your outworking and your effect and your influences in and through our lives and our ministries. Lord, I pray it for myself. I pray it for my brothers and sisters today. In Jesus' name.